here comes some thin films. Okay, weird topic um, in the world of optics uh, and wave optics, but we're going to be talking about thin films right here. Now, when we talk about a thin film, uh, we're still going to be talking about interference patterns, uh, maxima and minima, um, the bright and dark spots, but we're doing it for thin films. And what we mean by a thin film is something like a bubble. And we see a bubble here in this picture, but if you've got some soap sitting around your house, um, this is a Dawn dish soap. You use it to save the ducklings and whatnot. Um, here's another vessel I have to catch some soap. What I like to do when uh, my wife isn't watching, uh, I'm cleaning in the kitchen, I'll take the soap, and if I squeeze it quickly sometimes, I can get like bubbles to appear, right? And, uh, you know, maybe I just pour a little bit of this out so I get some soap at the top. But if you've got like a, a pack of bubbles at home or some soap, you can get some bubbles to appear. And when you get the bubbles to appear, they've got that classic kind of, uh, there it is. Whoa, here they go. They had that classic like rainbow look to them, right? Um, and that rainbow look is indicative of uh, the thin film interference that we're gonna be seeing today. I'm getting soap everywhere and you can't even see this on the screen because uh, the bubbles are so small, whatever. Um, it's everywhere, it's everywhere now. But these, ah, it's on my pants. This kind of like rainbow effect we see on bubbles or the rainbow effect that you see like on an oil slick. Like if you've ever been changing your oil in your car, you get some of it on your driveway um, or your garage, that kind of like shiny oil, that is a thin film setup. So how does these uh, maxima and minima actually occur in a thin film? What is causing them? And how can we as physicists start to interpret them into our mathematics so we can work out what's going on? Um, what is actually happening with a thin film is the following. Let's pretend we've got monochromatic coherent light um, and uh, this light is coming down, okay? This uh, gap right here, this is some film. So let's say it's a, let's say it's a bubble, right? Tiny bubbles. So there's actually three phases of the bubble here. There's outside the bubble. We're gonna call this N1. This is the first index of refraction, and it's a value of one because we're in the air, okay? So the light comes down through the air, and it hits the surface of the bubble. Now, some of the light is going to reflect right back up. It's gonna hit the surface of the bubble, and it's gonna reflect back up, okay? And when it does this, um, we're gonna to have to talk about reflections to see what happens there, but it's reflecting off the bubble. Some of the light, though, is going to go through the bubble. It's going to hit the inside of the bubble. So this is N2. This is our bubble. And then it's going to hit the barrier between N2 and N3. Like the inside of the bubble is air, right? So even though a bubble, like, you know, they're super thin. They feel like they don't have any thickness to them. There is an outside and an inside of the bubble. And on the outside, there's air, then the bubble, the top and bottom surface, and then there's air on the inside of the bubble. And what happens is when this light hits the backside of the bubble or the inside edge of it, some of it's gonna go through and just like, who cares? But what we really care about is some of this light is gonna bounce back up and it's gonna go out like that. And this is very fascinating because not only do we have two reflections, one, two, we also have some extra distance that this interior light has traveled. If this has a width of T or a thickness here, the light actually has gone down T and up T. So it's gone an extra distance of two times the thickness of the bubble here. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna look at a combination of the reflection at the surface and the reflection interior and the uh, twice thickness being traveled here, and we're gonna see what happens, okay? So let's first talk about uh, different reflections. There is a wonderful professor um, at Penn State who's got a website. Uh, this is Professor Daniel Russell. Um, does a lot of stuff with acoustics, which are sound waves. And although sound waves, you know, they're pressure waves, and we're talking about light waves, 
uh, a very similar idea in terms of reflection is going to apply. So let's think for a second about a wave kind of pulsing on a string, okay? Um, you know, if, you, if you've got a rope or something, you can snap it and a wave will propagate along it. And you may have seen this in a physics class. Um, some, we've got a bunch of like large springs at the high school that we snap and we watch the waves move along. Um, I call them my snakes, my slinkies. But um, if that reflection goes down the wave and it hits a hard boundary, and what we mean by a hard boundary is that this edge here, it's non-moving. It's not able to move. It's stuck. What will happen is the wave which starts on the top side will hit the hard boundary and it will turn over. And if we think about sine and cosine, what we've done here is we've switched from going up to the bottom, which means that we've actually had a phase change. We've phase shifted 180 degrees. If we think about that in terms of sine cosine, like I was saying, you know, here is a sine graph like this. Whoop. If you've gone from being up top to being down below, you have just shifted pi, radians, or 180 degrees. So that's what's happening here on a hard boundary. If you hit a hard boundary, you have a phase change of 180 degrees. If you hit a soft boundary, however, this is able to float up and down. So whenever you send the wave into this, it's like a hoop or something, it floats up, it comes back down, and it stays topside, this wave as it's moving. So there's no phase change here. A soft boundary has no phase change, okay? Now why this matters is it turns out that if we think about um, uh, densities, these hard and soft boundaries apply for densities as well. So if we go from a low density to a high density, some of the wave travels through, but you'll notice as this wave is on the top side and the low density to high, when it hits that high density right now, it is a hard reflection, it goes underneath, and we have a phase change of 180 degrees. When we go from a high density to a low density, our wave is going to hit, so our wave's coming in, in a high density, it strikes the low density barrier. When it comes back, it is still on the top side. There's no phase change. This is what is happening with our thin films. We have these types of reflections, these hard and soft boundary reflections occurring. And instead of just thinking about this as pi radians or 180 degrees, we can think of this as being, in terms of our waves, this is equal to the idea of half of a wavelength shift. And as soon as we start thinking about wavelength shifts, we need to start thinking about, oh boy, if we happen to match wavelength shifts perfectly, we may have constructive for maxima interference or destructive for minimas in terms of interference. And we need to take a look at what is going on here, okay? So this is how we do this. Um, while the light is coming directly into our thin film, it's very hard to draw like this because everything's just stacked on top of one another. So what we'll often draw in the world of physics, and you'll see this in textbooks all the time, is we'll actually draw the light coming in at an angle. It's not actually coming in at an angle, but it's easier to draw and see just what in the world is going on here. So our light's coming in. We get a reflection here and the light is coming out. We're gonna call this up here path length A. And due to this reflection, we need to see what the change in path length A is going to be. Due to this reflection, what is gonna happen? Is it a soft reflection and there is no phase change? Or is it a hard reflection and there is a phase change here? So. We looked at this in terms of density in that diagram, but density and refractive indexes, indexes of refraction, we could be thought of in a very similar way. We are going from a low index, like a low density, to a higher index. Um, bubbles are something around like 1.4, 1.5. So this is going to be a hard reflection. When your N1 is less than N2, or whatever you're in and whatever you're going to, this is going to be a hard reflection, okay? Uh, instead of calling this one and two, maybe it's best we call them um, the, uh, yeah, 
yeah, one and two is fine. I was going to call it like initial and final, but we never actually go in there. So let's just call it one and two. That's a hard reflection. And what this means is that this red light, as it reflects off of that, and it goes straight back up, even though we draw it at an angle, it is just phase shifted. It is phase shifted by 180 degrees or lambda over two. Okay, that's the first thing we need in a thin film problem. Um, if this was a soft reflection, that'd be zero, but it's not. It's a hard reflection here. It's lambda over two. Now, as this light comes in, doo -doo 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 boom, we get another reflection off the backside. Okay, so uh, when this light comes down, it strikes through. Um, we're now having a reflection on the kind of inside of the bubble. And uh, that reflection is taking place between N2 and N3, which is air, because there's air on the inside of our bubble. So since we're going from like a high density, so to speak, or a high index to a low index, um, this is a soft reflection in here, okay? This is a soft reflection. So if what you're going through is a higher density than, or higher index than the other thing, like if N1 was greater than N2, or in our case, N2 is greater than N3, this is a soft reflection. Um, the hard reflection gives us a wavelength shift of lambda over two, which we did up here. Uh, the soft does nothing, does diddly squat. So our light hits the backside of the bubble. It does not shift because of that due to the soft reflection, but it still had to travel some extra distance. It has traveled some extra distance here of twice the thickness of the bubble. Because remember, this isn't doing some weird angle. It's just coming down and then back up. It's just hard to draw like that. Um, which means that when we look at path B here, how has path B changed, which was the change in path B, the only difference is that it has gone twice the thickness. If it also had a hard reflection, we could say plus lambda over two, but it didn't. So whoop, that's it. Okay. So these are the two things we need. How did path B change going into the film? And how did path A change reflecting off of the film surface? Because what we can do now is we can say the following. We can say, and this is very important, the change in path B minus the change in path A is going to equal the total change in path of that light. And before we did this, we called this like the delta L or if you recall for like the double slit, this is what we called like D sine theta, okay? Really, we just needed a path length difference here to say, hey, look, if this path length difference happened to equal an integer wavelength shift, we got a bright fringe or a maxima. If for some reason this path length difference of m plus one half times lambda existed, if we had a half wavelength shift, we are gonna get a dark fringe or a minima. So this is a max and this is a minima that exists here, okay? So that's what we are doing in this problem. So if we take a look at what we did um, up here with our delta B and delta A, uh, what we had in our problem was we had 2t delta b minus delta a of lambda over 2. And if we want to find something like a bright point on that, we could say this is equal to m lambda. Now all we have to do is say, let's pick a value of m such that we can solve for something like, I don't know, what is the thickness of a soap bubble? Uh, kind of a wild question, but um, the smallest value of m we could pick and still have something here in this case is a value of 1. Um, our second fringe would be two, and then the third fringe is three and fourth, et cetera. But if we're looking for like the smallest value possible, then one would exist here and still satisfy this equation. If you put in zero, um, well, no, I guess, uh, I guess zero would actually work here. Um, the reason why zero would work here, zero, one, two, three, four, zero would actually work here because if you put in a zero for M, then what you just have is two T equals lambda over two, as you move this lambda over two to the other side. Um, and this means that the thickness of our soap film will just equal lambda over four, okay? Um, so that would be like for a bright, if we had slightly different setups, uh, are we looking for a dark? Um, we could get a slightly different answer 
Uh, if you work the same thing out, and we'll do that for a dark in a later example, um, you'll see that the other possible example we could have is the thickness is lambda over two. One of these will have to be your answer every time you do this problem. Your answer for a thickness will either be lambda over four, or it will be lambda over two. The only way to know which one you have is to actually work through the problem. And what I recommend for my students every time they have a thin film problem is to draw it and work through it step by step like we did. It's very hard to just say like, oh, I've got a hard and a soft or a soft and a hard in this order and now I know I'm gonna get this. It's much easier to actually work through the problem and see what you're gonna get. But either way, as long as your answer is uh, lambda over four or lambda over two, you know you at least did, uh, you got a 50-50 shot at getting it right. So even if you don't know, guess one of them. Now the only thing in these answers that's a little weird is uh, when we take a look at this lambda, this lambda is the thickness inside the thin film. And why does that matter? Well, when this light goes into the thin film, it is refracting, it's slowing down, which means if I say that we shot monochromatic red light at 700 nanometers, this isn't 700 nanometers. The wavelength inside the film or inside the index is equal to the proper wavelength in a vacuum divided by the index that you're in. So this would be like the index of the film or N2. We talked about this equation early on in wave optics and I said it'd be coming back here it is. This drops down into these two equations here. So the equations more accurately look something along the lines of T equals lambda proper over 4N, or they could equal something like T equals lambda proper over 2 times N, where this is the index of the film, which is traditionally M2 or N2. Okay, so that is how you set up a thin film problem. Um, it takes some time to get used to it. Uh, they're a little weird the first time you do them, um, but this is what we see on soap bubbles. It's what we see on oil slicks. Uh, it's what we see when, if you have like two pieces of glass that you set on top of each other, um, that's called Newton's rings. Uh, and the air pocket that's inside there is actually acting as a thin film. Um, uh, and, uh, even video game designers have tried to put uh, thin film into their video games to try to give a more realistic experience and to kind of key players into some things. Um, but this is the idea of thin films. This is how to work them out. Uh, take your time with these type of problems and you will get the right answer. Um, we'll see some of those examples later on, but for right now, this is finished. Adios and take it easy.